you're here for the first time at Hollywood Community Church today, and, and you might sit back and say, the book of Ruth, what in the world does that have to do with Christmas? I came today to hear about the incarnation. I came today to hear about Jesus being born. And quite frankly, here at HCC, as in most churches, that's the way we normally approach Christmas. We talk out of Luke chapter 2 or Matthew chapter 1, and we talk about the birth of Jesus. Or, or maybe we go back to the Old Testament prophecies, and, and we take the prophecies of the Old Testament prophets who talked about Jesus' birth. But this year, we wanted to look at the Christmas story from a different perspective. We wanted to look at the Christmas story, we've said, with a twist. Because the story of Christmas is not just a New Testament story. The story of Christmas is not just a story that is found in, in the Gospels, Matthew and Mark and Luke. But the story of Christmas, the story of Jesus, is found all throughout Scripture. And it's important for us to realize that Jesus' coming and Jesus' birth was not just something that God had to do as a secondary response to man's sin, but rather from the very foundation of the world, God had planned to send His Son, Jesus Christ, to come and live among us and give His life for us. And so the Bible is a story Christmas. And so as we've told the story the last few days, or the last few weeks, we told it very briefly to the boys and girls today, we've looked at the story of Ruth because we've simply said this, that the story of Ruth is the story of Christmas. And today we're looking at the last few verses. And so we're in Ruth chapter 4. I'm going to read verses 11 through 22 and uh, make some brief comments today. We'll be brief with the families in here today. So Ruth chapter 4, I'll put the verses up on the screen. Then all the people who were at the gate and the elders said, We are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your house, so they're speaking to Boaz at the city gate. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your house like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the house of Israel. May you act worthily in Ephrathah, and we'll talk about that in just a moment, and be renowned in Bethlehem. And may your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah because of the offspring of the Lord, because the offspring that the Lord will give you by this young woman. Let me just pause for a second and say, verse 12 relates to us another Old Testament story which shows the providence and grace of God. And we're going to look at that real briefly on Christmas Eve. Notice verse 13. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. And he went into her, notice this phrase, and the Lord gave her conception, and she bore a son. Then the woman, the women said to Naomi, to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a Redeemer, and may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons, has given birth to him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him on her lap, became his nurse and the women of the neighborhood gave him a name saying a son has been born to Naomi they named him Obed he was the father of Jesse who is the father of David now these are the generations of Perez Perez fathered Hezron Hezron fathered Ram Ram fathered Aminadab Aminadab fathered Nashon Nashon fathered Salmon, Salmon fathered Boaz, Boaz fathered Obed, Obed fathered Jesse, and Jesse father, fathered David. So, so as I read, this has been such a great story, and, and by the way, I, I've appreciated all the positive comments that we've received from the congregation as we've gone through the story the last couple of weeks, but as I read through this great story, I've asked myself the question, why would you end such a great story like this with a genealogy? It, isn't the most exciting part of the story generally at the end? I mean, where the conclusion happens and there's a hero or a heroine and, and something tremendous and exciting and you end the book with a great feeling about the book. 
But the book of Ruth doesn't necessarily end that way. It ends with a genealogy. This person followed this person, this person fathered this person, and this person fathered this person. And we ask ourselves the question, why would the writer of Ruth end the book of Ruth with a genealogy? Could there be a reason? Could there be something that he was trying to show us? Something that God wanted us to see. Well, it's interesting because the last three verses of the book of Ruth are found three other times in Scripture. As a matter of fact, those three verses, those genealogies, are found three other times. And I want you to see another time where it's found. So if you have your Bible or your iPhone, we'll put it up on the screen. Go back with me or go forward with me to the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1. In Matthew chapter 1, we find the genealogy of none other than Jesus Christ. And we find the verses from the end of the book of Ruth (coughs) in Matthew chapter 1 in the genealogy of Jesus. Notice Matthew chapter 1 beginning in verse 4. It says this. We just read these verses, but you'll see them now in the Gospels. And Ram fathered Aminadab, and Aminadab the father of Nashon, and Nashon the father of Salmon, and Salmon the father of Boaz by Rahab, and Boaz the father of Obed by whom? By Ruth, and Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of David the king. Jump down with me to verse 17. Because the writer of Matthew pulls all this together. Matthew pulls it all together. He says, so all the generations from Abraham to David were 14 generations. And from David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations. And from the deportation of Babylon to Christ, 14 generations. So here's what I want you to see. The book of Ruth was written for the purpose of connecting Ruth, first of all, with her great-grandson David. Most of us have heard of King David. Ruth was his great-grandmother. So the book of Ruth is written to connect Ruth with King David, but even more importantly, it was written to connect Ruth with her future relative, whom? None other than Jesus Christ. So if you have your outline in front of you, here's the simple point of the message today. The story of Ruth points to the incarnation of Jesus. That's why the book of Ruth was written. It's a great love story. It's a great romantic story. It shows the providence of God. It shows how God takes care of his people. But the reason this book was written was not just to tell us the story of Ruth and Boaz, but it was written to point us and to point the children of Israel to Jesus Christ. It was written to connect the dots between the Old Testament and the New Testament. It was written to connect the dots between Ruth and her family and Jesus and his family. So you see, Ruth is a Christmas story that predates the Christmas story. Ruth tells us about Jesus without actually telling us about Jesus. You may have noticed that as we read through those verses in Ruth chapter 4, But I want to show you this morning quickly three truths from those verses that will guide us from beyond the book of Ruth, beyond Ruth, Boaz, and Obed, and direct us to Jesus. So just three simple things today that you might have already seen in the passages we've read it. So the first is this. If you have your little outline in front of you, the first thing I said is this. Like Obed, who was Ruth's son, Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Did you catch that? Did you catch where Obed was born? In Bethlehem. The events of Ruth both begin and end in the city of Bethlehem. Uh, Today you and I can hop on a plane and we can fly into, probably would fly into Tel Aviv and we could take a bus to Jerusalem and just five to seven miles from the city of Jerusalem is 
the town of Bethlehem. Today, it's a, it's a larger town. It, it's a modern town. But during Old Testament times and during New Testament times, it was just a small, little town. In Spanish, we'd call it a, a pueblo. It wouldn't even be may, maybe just a village. But it was a small village that, even during Old Testament times, bore quite a bit of significance. As you read through the Old Testament, you may remember that in Genesis chapter 48, Rachel, Jacob's wife, died in Bethlehem. It was called Ephrathah back then, but she died in Bethlehem. Both King Saul and King David were from Bethlehem. And if you're familiar with the Old Testament, you'll know that Bethlehem became known as the city of David. Then, of course, we have Micah's great prophecy in Micah chapter 5 and verse 2, where Micah said this hundreds of years before Jesus was born. He said, But you, O Bethlehem, Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from old, from ancient of days. Those verses connect us directly to the account of Jesus' birth that John read for us just a few moments ago from Luke chapter 4 that tells us that Joseph went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, to where? To the city of David, which is called Bethlehem. Why? Because he was of the house and the lineage of David. We also could say because he was of the house and lineage of whom? Of Ruth. Of Obed, of Boaz, and Ruth. So, so like Obed here in the book of Ruth, Jesus was born in the city of Jerusalem. There's a second truth, and I want you to think with me this morning. The second truth is this. Like Obed, Jesus' birth was orchestrated by God. Ruth chapter 4 and verse 13, we find a, a very unique phrase, and I want to read it again. It says this, So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife, and he went into her. Notice this phrase. It's a unique phrase in the Old Testament. It says this, And the Lord gave her conception. So I read that. I thought, and like, like many of you, I've, I've read through the Old Testament many times. I don't think I've, I've seen that phrase before. The Lord gave her conception conception. There are similar phrases in the Old Testament. For example, in Genesis chapter 30, it says this, that the Lord opened her womb. And there's times that there's indications that, that God is intimately involved in birth as God opens the womb, as God allows a, a lady to conceive. But this phrase, the Lord gave her conception, is a phrase that is unique. Now, please don't misunderstand what I'm saying this morning. I am not saying that Obed, like Jesus Christ, was virgin born. That is not what this passage is saying. But Obed's birth clearly foreshadows or foretells, we might say, the miraculous Holy Spirit caused birth of Jesus Christ. I would remind you what Matthew tells us in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 18. He says, now the birth of Jesus took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child, how? From the Holy Spirit. Luke chapter 1 gives us a little bit more detail. The angel says to Mary, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the very Son of God. Here's what I want you to see today. Jesus' birth was orchestrated by God. He was born of an earthly mother, Mary. He was born from a heavenly father. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit overshadowed Mary. And you might sit back today and say, okay, Brian, how exactly did that happen? Explain to me how it was exactly that Mary conceived. And how was it that Joseph and Mary had a baby? Can you explain it? And the simple truth is this, I can't explain it. But I know what the Bible teaches. And the Bible teaches that Jesus' birth 
was miraculous. It was God conceived. It was God causing Mary to be with child. Ruth helps us to see that profound truth. Let me pause for a second today because you might sit back and say, okay, Brian, what's the big deal? Why does it even matter? Why do we make such a big deal about the virgin birth? Why does it even matter? And it matters for this reason, because Jesus was not just 100% man. He had an earthly mother, but he was also 100% God. He had an earthly father. He was the God-man. And as the God-man, he was fully capable of giving his life for us. So we not only believe in the complete humanity of Jesus Christ, but we believe in the complete deity of Jesus Christ. How is that possible? It was possible because Jesus' birth was orchestrated by God. And I believe Ruth foreshadows that. It foretells us to a certain degree of the birth of Jesus. Let me show you one other phrase that I think is interesting, and we'll pull all of this together this morning. And the third point in your outline is this. Like Obed, Jesus came to redeem and to restore. Let me read once again verses 14 and 15 of Ruth chapter 4 because the women, after Obed was born, the women come to know me and, they, and they're thrilled. I mean, this lady who, who came back to Bethlehem with no hope, remember she said that she went away, em- or she went away full, but she came back empty. And all of a sudden, this lady who had come back to Bethlehem completely empty with no hope, all of a sudden has hope. And she has a grandson. And so the women said to Noemi, Blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day. And notice the wording that is used. Has not left you this that day without what? Without a redeemer. And may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher in your old age. As I mentioned a few moments ago, Ruth had returned to Bethlehem saying, don't call me, or excuse me, Naomi Naomi had returned to Bethlehem saying, don't call me Naomi, call me Mara, which means bitter. I left full, but I have come back empty. Naomi thought her life was over. Her husband was dead. Her sons were dead. She had no means to support herself. She had no hope for a future heir. Until Obed was born. And when Obed was born, his birth saved Naomi. Not in a spiritual sense, but in, a, but in, a, but in an emotional, in a, in a life purpose sense. His birth saved Naomi, gave her purpose, and gave her hope for the future. I sit back and I think, what a beautiful picture Jesus. Think with me today. All of us here this morning are like Naomi at the end of chapter 1. We're empty. We're spiritually dead because of our sins. We have no means to support and to save ourselves. We have no hope for the future. But God in his great love sent a son. Not just any son, but God in his great love sent us his son. And Jesus came for the purpose of what? Of redeeming us and restoring us. It was Jesus who made the statement in Matthew 20, 28. He says this. He said, I came not to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. In other words, here's what Jesus said. Jesus said, I have come to redeem and I have come to restore life. Paul says it this way in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 7. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. In Jesus, you and I can be redeemed you and I can be restored to life. We're restored back to our original purpose. 
I made the statement just a few moments ago that the story of Christmas is not just a New Testament story, but it's a whole Bible story. And when we talk about us being restored, to understand that, we have to go all the way back to the very beginning. Because in Genesis chapter 1, it says that God created man. He created man and woman in his image. And so you and I were created in the very image of God. In other words, we were created for the purpose of being God's image bearers. That's why we were created. Genesis chapter 1. But all of a sudden, Genesis chapter 3 happens. And what enters the world? Sin enters the world. And, and Adam and Eve and us, as a result, were marred. And we no longer reflect whom we are supposed to reflect. We're no longer the image bearers that God always intended for us to be. And so God, in his great love, rather than just wiping the world clean of all of us and saying, okay, I'm done with them, God sits back and he does what? He sends his only son, Jesus Christ. He sends his son. The son comes for the purpose of redeeming us. And not only redeeming us, but restoring us to who God always intended for us to be. So the story of Christmas is a story of redemption. The story of Christmas is the story of restoration. It's the story of us being able to become who God always intended for us to be. So this morning as we conclude the book of Ruth, here's what I want you to see. Like Ruth, like Boaz, and like Obed, you and I have a purpose. And our purpose is to point others to Jesus. That's the purpose. Uh, I mean, we've spent all this time, four weeks, talking about this story. We've talked about this great life of, of, of what's happened to Naomi and Ruth and how Boaz came into the scene and God in his great providence works all of that out. Why does God tell us that story? Because their lives point not to themselves, but their lives point us to Jesus Christ. And that's what God desires for us. So, so my challenge to you this Christmas season is this. It's more a question to you this Christmas season. Is your life pointing others to Jesus? That's the purpose of our lives. That's the purpose of Christmas. I made a statement last week that's probably seemed like a rather harsh statement, and I get it. I said, you know... There's, life is filled with all kinds of tragedies, and so many of our congregation have experienced so many tragedies, and man, man the last thing I want to do is minimize any of them. Uh, I feel for you. I'm with you as you're going through those tragedies. But I submit to you that in the midst of all of those tragedies, one of the greatest tragedies of life is for us to live our lives and not fulfill the purpose for which we were created. And that purpose is not to make money, it's not to produce kids, it's not to have a great life, it's not to be able to retire successfully, it's not to have a great career. Those are wonderful things, and all of those things help us. As we look at this whole life gospel, all of those things help us become who God wants us to be. But the simple truth is this, that God created you in your life, through your actions, through your work, through your family, through what you do Monday through Friday, God created you for the purpose of pointing others to Jesus. You are his image bearer. How are you reflecting his image? That's the story of Ruth. Ruth is there, a great story, but Ruth does what? It points us to Jesus Christ is what it does. And the challenge for us is what? Be like Ruth. Be like Boaz. Be like Obed. Let's point others.